I'm George Gallo, and I present Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kali Mahorra means free word. That's what I speak. So Kali Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, in London. And we're talking about Iraq, but more particularly, we're talking about the Kurdish people. More than 40 millions strong, left high and dry by the Sykes-Picot agreements and by the Treaty of Versailles at the end of the First World War. The largest national group with no right of self-determination anywhere and now for almost a hundred years. This is a grave problem, not just for the Kurds, because of course if Kurdish self-determination can be described as an irresistible force, then the immovable object is the fact that in order to exercise that right of self-determination, pre-existing states are going to have to be broken up. Now, that's a major undertaking, even in today's topsy-turvy turmoil of the Middle East. It cannot be resolved piece by piece, in my opinion, though some of our distinguished experts in the audience may have a different point of view, because the other powers who don't want to break up their territory but are quite content to see their neighbours break up theirs, have to be taken into account. We're looking today at what the agenda is in the Declaration of Independence, a separate state of Kurdistan by the Iraqi Kurdish leader Barzani. We're looking at the timing of it. We're looking at the friends of it, the foes of it, what the practicalities are, for example, the issue of Kirkuk, Iraq's second largest oil field, and the ethnic cleansing that has taken place there, the forced repopulation of Kirkuk in order to try and gerrymander a result in any self-determination test there. This is a grave problem. The Kurds have been massacred in many of the countries into which they were placed against their will without anyone consulting them at all. The worst massacres in the recent period have been in Turkey. And this brings me to another vexatious issue. As the British peer, member of the House of Lords, Lord Archer, once put it, when tasked with the apparent contradiction that he was supporting Iraqi Kurds against the Iraqi regime in Baghdad, but opposing Turkish Kurds against the uh, Turkish NATO ally in Ankara, he said pricelessly, ah, well, you see, there are good Kurds and there are bad Kurds. And what he meant was the good Kurds are those who are fighting our enemies and the bad Kurds are those who are fighting our friends. And this can be glimpsed again in the international reaction to Barzani's declaration of independence. Only one country has leapt forward to say that they will recognize this independent state and give it every assistance that they can. And that country is Netanyahu's Israel. That should come as no surprise because Israel has been deeply involved with Iraqi Kurdish struggles for many decades. That does not invalidate those struggles, but it places in a certain light the hypocrisy of an Israeli state that will not recognize Palestinian rights of self-determination, but demands that people should recognize the right of self-determination by the Kurds in Iraq. Probably not the Kurds in Turkey, depending on what the current calibration of relations between uh, Israel and President Erdogan is. As that changes most days, I'm not entirely up to date with it. 
It's also undeniably true that the United States currently favors the breakaway from the Iraqi state of Kurdistan. And that too should not come as a surprise because they too are hypocrites ready to leave UNESCO because it has the temerity to invite Palestinians into it, but ready to break up Iraq and use its enormous financial and, and uh, diplomatic and even military power to uh, defend the Kurds' right to their own independent state. Has Barzani miscalculated or is this a kind of masterstroke? ISIS are on the retreat, Kurdish people in Iraq, but more particularly actually in Syria, have played an heroic role in the defeat of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and those who think and act like them. It may be that Barzani is calculating that the Kurdish idea has quite a bit of political capital in the bank now and that this is the time to cash it in. But what will be the impact on neighboring countries like Iran, which also has a Kurdish population, Syria, which is coming to the end, one hopes, of its long war against foreign aggression and invasion of its territory, is its army going to have fought all these years to capture every last inch of Syrian territory only to give it away to the Kurdish forces who have played a role, no doubt, in the defeat of ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Syria. One thing's for sure, Erdogan is not going to recognize Kurdish rights. It's not so long ago. It was illegal even to speak Kurdish in Turkey. Great cities in Turkey have been leveled like it was the Second World War by a NATO member, Erdogan, and a Western ally, at least the last time I looked. Well, all of these are complicated subjects. Everyone in here is entitled to their Kali Mahorra, their free word about them. I'm responsible for what I say. al Maidin is not responsible for what I say. And everyone here is responsible for, for what they are about to say now. Our first guest is indeed a distinguished expert, an Iraqi, Dr. Sami Ramadani. The floor is yours. Go ahead, kick us off. Thank you, thank you, George. Um, one thing you referred to in your introduction, George, was has Barzani miscalculated? Because I want to go to the heart of the matter here. And I think this is a key question. It's a key question because Barzani is not a democratically elected leader of the Kurdish people. His presidency expired two years ago. He's a dictator. When I say dictator, I mean it literally, because he and his uh, clan members are controlling Iraqi Kurdistan or large parts of Iraqi Kurdistan. So what the, the referendum he has called for does not represent the right of the Kurdish people to self-determination, which I have always supported and will always support throughout my political life. His son, Masrur, controls the intelligence service. He's head of intelligence. His other son, uh, 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 Mansour is a senior general in the Peshmerga. His nephew, Najirvan Barzani, is the prime minister. His brother, Waji, is another senior general in, in the Peshmerga. And every Kurd knows, whether his supporters or critics in Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, uh, and his critics are numerous. They represent, in my opinion, probably the majority of the Kurdish people, because they see the corruption, they see what Kurdistan has been brought down to, agriculture is ruined, uh, there's an elite that rules the country, and he, his power base has been threatened. And that's where the timing comes in, George. His power base has been threatened because more and more Kurdish people are opposing his rule and his corruption, including many members of the Iraqi parliament. What about Kirkuk? Kirkuk is 
vitally important. It is an Iraqi vital interest. Yet the uh, government uh, in Kurdistan is determined that they shall have Kirkuk. The seeds of an actual war, an all-out war, are uh, present in that uh, conundrum, are they not? Kirkuk, as you say, is extremely important to, to Iraq in general, to the Kurdish people, to Arabs, to the Turkomans who live uh, in Kirkuk. Kirkuk has always been a mixed city. The 1957 uh, uh, refer- uh, plebiscite uh, sen- census which everybody agrees to, including uh, the Kurdish leadership, 1957 census showed that uh, 49% of the population were Kurdish and about uh, uh, 30% uh, were uh, uh, Arab and about 20% uh, Turkoman. And there are uh, one or 2% other, other minorities. But what Barzani has done is not only take over Kirkuk, but a large swathes of the Diyala province, wiped out some Arab villages, uh, generating um, uh, ethnic cleansing in the areas his forces have controlled, and areas within the Mosul, Nineveh uh, province. His forces, the Peshmerga forces, used to control Sinjar, the capital of the Yazidi people. His Peshmerga withdrew from Sinjar 24 hours before ISIS arrived. As soon as ISIS started taking over Mosul, his forces moved, and expanded the territory under his control by more than a third of the entire area of uh, uh, regional uh, Kurdistan, the regional government of Kurdistan. So you can see that there was a de facto, de, I, and I stress de facto because I don't know all the, all the ins and outs of the secrets of Barzani's uh, relations, but de facto there was an alliance between ISIS and the Peshmerga forces that were under his his control. Another aspect that people should, I think, uh, point out, George, is that the media here does not tell us that there was a bitter civil war in Iraqi Kurdistan between the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan led by Talbani and the Kurdistan Democratic Party led by Barzani. From 1994 to 1998, thousands of Kurds died. And this split is still here today. There are two states in Kurdistan, not one. States within states. One led by the PQK and uh, other organizations, and one led by KDP's Barzani. So you have uh, the elements of a Sudan situation, South Sudan situation, that this is not a genuine uh, uh, self-determination cause, which I support very strongly. The Kurdish people have fought for decades to gain their rights, but their rights have been trampled upon by an elite that has uh, sequestered, that has robbed their struggles, and have established corrupt rule. And I think this will lead to another Kurdish civil war. What he's doing is gambling with the fate of the Kurdish people. And he shouldn't do that. Sulaimania, the cultural capital of Kurdistan, Erbil is the administrative capital, overwhelmingly is against what Barzani is doing. And the media needs to report that as well, that the Kurdish people are not represented fairly, democratically, by the leadership of Barzani. The complexities of the situation are enormous. There are a million Kurds, George, in Baghdad, mm-hmm. more than any Kurdish city. I know many of them. Uh, and, and, and this is uh, uh, something that is not also uh, reported, that there are loads of villages, towns, cities, which are mixed. What's he going to do? This fragmentation of the region is not in the interest of the Kurdish people or the peoples of the region which are faced with terrorism, with U.S. Uh, interference and interventions and wars, as we know. They destroyed Libya. They, are dis- they have nearly destroyed Syria. They destroyed uh, much of Iraq. And what they are doing is f- to further fragment the region. They are losing in Syria. What have they opened? They want to open another front in Kurdistan as a base against Iran. There are strategic interests involved there. Uh, Israel and the United States want to use Iraqi Kurdistan as a base against Iran. So this is yet another dimension in which Barzani is dragging the Kurdish people and trampling, in my opinion, on their historic right to self-determination within a democratic Kurdistan and within a democratic Iraq. And this is 
what the Iraqi democratic movements have been struggling for for many decades, George, since I speak, in fact, that they see the struggle of the Kurdish people as part of the struggle of the Iraqi people for democracy. Once that is achieved, then it is then that the Kurdish people can freely and democratically exercise their national right to self-determination. It's not just, uh, um, if you like, strategic the Israeli interest, is it? They have a clear strategic interest causing problems for Iran, causing problems for Iraq, a once mighty Arab country, rich and powerful. Uh, it's an ideological uh, thing for them. They believe, have to believe, in ethno-religious states. Uh, they would like to create them elsewhere too. In Lebanon, in Syria, they have tried hard to bring about uh, ethno-religious states as a justification for their own uh, self-declared ethno-religious state. Isn't that right? I think you are absolutely right. They want to create a mirror image. And that, what will that do for them politically in the world is that we are the uh, democratic state which can protect minorities, we can protect all these minorities which are being uh, uh, subjugated in the region by the likes of ISIS or Al-Qaeda or whichever terrorist group that they, Israel, might want to support. And there are enough evidence now to show that Israel were in league with Al-Qaeda in Syria. This is beyond doubt. Netanyahu himself visited their injured uh, uh, fighters in, uh, in the occupied Golan Heights, the Syrian uh, uh, territory uh, that Israel occupied since 1967. And those they cannot treat in the Golan Heights, they uh, took in, with helicopters to, to, to other hospitals inside Israel. They're, they are in league with Al-Qaeda precisely for the project you have pointed out. They want to create that ethno- uh, uh, mirror image, ethnocentric mirror I, image. I, I, I just have one final question to you, then we'll go to the break. Will Iraq fight to stop this? And is the current government in Iraq strong enough to fight and succeed in stopping this? I'm not a supporter of the Baghdad government. Uh, as you probably uh, know, George, I've always, all my political, I fought for democratic rights for the Iraqi people. And this government uh, ha is, has been tainted by the occupation of Iraq in 2003 by the United States. Uh, the constitution that by which they rule, I find extremely harmful to the long-term interests of the Iraqi people, including the, the, the Kurdish people. Has Barzani asked them for self-determination? What, what would he do with, uh, with hundreds of thousands of other uh, ethnicities? The Yazidis, by the way, are extremely critical of Barzani's leadership. The Yazidis whose women were kidnapped by the thousands by, by ISIS. Go and ask any Yazidi and they'll tell you that Barzani had it in for them because they never supported his, his leadership. Much more of this after the break. This is Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, but talking about the Kurdish people, their rights, and in particular, the step taken by the Kurdish leader Barzani in declaring, or declaring that he's going to declare, the actual independence of Kurdistan and the breakup of the Iraqi state. We took the Kali Mahorra camera onto the streets of London to hear what the people thought. Take a look at this. Do you think that the Kurds have the right to ask for an independent state? Well, I mean, I don't support the superimposition of any conglomerate state on a union that wants to be independent. I also think it's a flaw to have this nationalistic standpoint. But mainly I think that they should absolutely be allowed to ask for independence. Kurdistan should stay part of Iraq because at the point they're financially and politically unstable. I think that anyone in the world should have 
the right to ask for independence that as long as they have actually a strong case about it and they know how they're going to get through this process. I think this is the most important part and not do it with violence and with many, many people who are being heard about this. But definitely they have been, uh, they have been oppressed by the Turkish government. They have had many, many conflicts in Syria too. And they are in some part independent, but they have to be recognized internationally so they could actually make progress towards their own state and nation. So do you think that the Kurds have the right for an independent state? So from my personal uh, perspective, um, I think historically speaking, um, Kurd the Kurds have been the forgotten ones of Saxon and Pico agreements. Um, obviously those agreements have done, I think, tremendous damage to the region. At the very moment, I don't really think the Kurdish uh, should really go for it, the Kurdish people, because Iraqi forces right now are fighting, for, fighting against ISIS and me as a Middle Eastern Arab, I really have some doubts about the, support, the, the supporters of the referendum. So I'm not really sure who's, who really supports the Kurdish uh, referendum, whether, whether it's Western, Western countries or the United States. Well, quite a, an educated response there on the streets of London. Let's hear what the equally, even more educated, distinguished audience here in London think. Yes, sir, the floor is yours. My name is Dr. Mohammed Haider. I'm a financial analyst by our teacher by profession and some political practice and analysis. Two major points I'm really concerned uh, uh, about is, one is, uh, uh, who are the forces uh, who are putting, uh, putting their weight behind the driving the, the Kurdish people or the Kurdish leadership to go into that grave, as you described? And why now? I wouldn't say it's independence as much as separating. The second issue is the economic issue. Is there any economic and financial sustainability for this uh, Kurdish, let's say, government or Kurdish new nation, uh, can they really survive by taking such a decision? The first issue is who is behind. Definitely, some of them, they identified themselves, like the Israeli, like the American, and some of the Europeans who really were pushing, whether uh, uh, publicly or under the table or behind the curtain, to push the Kurdish into such a situation. Uh, who will uh, bear the consequences, and that's what it comes when it comes for the economic uh, sustainability. Uh, from economic and financial point of view, I can see that this this region is coming to a really very difficult and hardship from economic point of view. Uh, first of all, uh, the whole region is passing through a very difficult situation. Uh, there is a chaos in the whole area, and the chaos, or who behind the chaos, the chaos is the United States and others as well. Plus, we contribute ourselves, our leadership, our the Arab countries are contributing toward this situation, and we are not serving our people properly. But from economic point of view, first of all, if this nation has to rise, first of all, the the borders is with the four major countries, Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Turkey. And none of these countries agree to what happened. And no one will allow them to trade or use their border for communicating or transporting or have any connection with the rest of the world. Each country is entitled to say, I'm closing my borders. No planes are allowed, allowed to go and fly in our sky. So what's happening now? There is a big chaos inside. Nobody is talking about it. They are contributing to selling the, the Iraqi oil, giving it some of them to the Turks through personal agreement between the Barzani family and the, uh, and the Turkish, uh, who are, whether it be uh, the son of Erdogan at the moment, or the oil coming from Syria. It's all coming through this corridor. But it's not going to continue because now the situation is threatening the whole four nations, the whole countries. So this is dangerous for the whole region. And we have to, this issue has to be really taken in consideration. And I would say a peaceful approach 
with the Kurds and based on a common understanding and not leading the region into another civil war and mainly between the Iraqi themselves. Well, that's all uh, common sense, of course, and not very different from what uh, your colleague uh, said. So it falls to me, I think, then to uh, put the uh, Kurdish point of view as the devil's uh, advocate. You see, at the end of the First World War, the United States said that self-determination was to be the future. But the Kurdish people never got it. In fact, they never got recognition that they were a people. But they very clearly are a national group. They have a common language, a common culture, a common history, and they want, overwhelmingly, uh, wherever they are, whether it's London or in the, uh, the north of Syria or in uh, Iraq they, or in Turkey, they want to be recognized as a national group. Now, my political standpoint, which is not that different from Dr. Sami's, is that all nations have the right of self-determination. They don't have to have a separate state necessarily in order to exercise that right of self-determination. But if they want to have a separate state, they must have one. And it's everybody else's responsibility to try and make them feel welcome where they are, try and make the arrangements that will satisfy them uh, where they are. Now, it would appear, although I'm not an expert on it, I've never been in Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, it would appear that the time has come so far as the Kurds in Iraq are concerned. After all, they have had a very substantial amount of autonomy, actually for a very long time. Even under Saddam Hussein, they had a measure of autonomy. Then they effectively were not governed by Baghdad. And since the uh, Iraq war in 2003, they have had, again, a substantial measure of autonomy. It would appear that that has not satisfied them and that they do want to have an independent state. Now, you make the point, Doctor, that, of course, a peaceful approach and a non-sectarian approach and so on is necessary here now. But when the chips are down, if an independent state is declared and Kirkuk is declared to be a part of it, well, there'll be no longer uh, any possibility of a peaceful approach to that, will there? The issue it becomes here is, uh, I think, the financial reward. <clears throat> what is the financial reward and why Kirkuk in the, itself? Kirkuk is a, like a cosmopolitan uh, uh, region or province in total. It has Christian, Muslims, Arab, Kurds, Turkmen, all these kind of people. Will, for example, uh, the Arab have the right to decide their destiny there? Will well, they? Uh, 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 of course, that's. Will the Will the Assyrians or the Christians have the right to say we want our own independence or our own autonomy? We want to live in this in this province. Because we have a common language, we have, uh, we have a common belief, we have... The, this is the, what I'm saying, I this is the dangerous the, issue. Uh, you don't have to tell me. Uh, uh, it, you have to take the Christian thing out because that's not a nationality. There are Christians uh, of all kinds in the, in the region. But there's yeah. no doubt that the Turkmen and the Syrian and Arabs also have national rights. The, the fight in the region, in the Kurdish re the region, is not a matter of identity. It's a social fight against the imperialism. This is the, that's why this Kurdish uh, party is a socialist party. It's not a national Kurdish party. This is the difference. Barzani is a socialist? Not the, not the Barzani. I mean, in, in, uh, Barzani fled to Russia after the... Uh, that was the father, yeah. The, the 1964, yes. So, uh, but I'm saying the, the fight, for, for example, the Kurdish in, uh, in the eastern, in the southeastern region of Turkey are socialist people. It's nothing to do with being, they are communists. PKK. Not be, the PKK. Is, so they are an anti-imperialism movement. And it's not only there, it's in the whole region. Mm. 
And that's why they don't want to show it as, as like poor people are for like proletariat, like fighting the rich people. Well, the but PKK the Kurds are, are trapped uh, now in this. Mm. The PKK are undoubtedly a, a leftist party, but yes. uh, they're also a Kurdish nationalist party. You, can't, you yeah. can't deny that. Yeah, but with the communist ideology. Well, that sounds all right. Yeah. Let's you take see? the uh, let's yeah, take this lady. <laughs> let's take this lady here. Okay. Yes, madam. Hello. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I am Ajin Omar. I am a medical lawyer from background. Uh, I am a law lecturer at Nottingham Trent University, and at the same time, I'm a doctoral researcher. I'm uh, researching the current healthcare system of Kurdistan region, and I'm originally from Sulaymaniya. Um, I would like to, I have got actually a few questions for uh, Mr. Sami. As an Arab from Baghdad, uh, as you indicated, although you disagree from my understanding with Berzani's uh, party, but you are not opposing our rights as Kurdish to become an independent. And I, the point that is not clear to me is that when do you think is the right for us to call for independence? Um, it's not for me to say for a starter, by the way. I'm following what a lot of the Kurdish uh, Democrats and socialists are proposing for Iraqi Kurdistan. They believe strongly, as you would, as I do, yeah in the right of the Kurdish people to self-determination. But they say self-determination, and this is critical, mm -hmm. cannot be exercised definitely today in Iraqi Kurdistan. Not today. Be not today, okay. okay? And they say these, uh, this right, which is sacred to them and to the Kurdish people, can and should only be exercised within a democratic Iraqi Kurdistan, and they stress within a democratic Iraq because they say we should not become an independent state against the will and interests of our neighboring peoples. Iraqi Kurdistan or Kurdistan in general is not on the moon. It's in the Middle East. Yeah. They well, need they need a good we'll relation. Come back to you. We'll come back well, to you. We yeah. need the they need the good relations with the people of Iran, with the people of the rest of the people of Iraq, with the people of Turkey, with the people of Syria. You look at Syria. Uh, uh, Syria would have would be fragmented to to smithereens if there is no degree of unity. So I look at it from the point of view of the interests of the Kurdish people and of the Iraqi people in general and the peoples of the region. We we belong to a region which is subjected to occupations, to wars, to Israeli expansion. Uh, our 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 countries are being uh, attacked and uh, and practically destroyed before our eyes. And Barzani is adding to that, and he's definitely not doing it for the sake of the Kurdish people, but for that corrupt elite that I talked about. Thank you. Madam, please. Yeah, please. as a Kurdish national, I would like to know what is the best approach, and that's why I'm here. Okay. Well, look, it's getting spirited. We better take a break. with me, George Galloway, for Al Maidin Television, coming from London, but discussing Kurdistan and, indeed, the wider issue of Kurdish national rights. We took the camera onto the streets of London to hear what the people thought. Take a look at this. Why do you think Israel is the only country that supports an independent Kurdistan? Well, I believe because Israel is trying to take more opportunity in the Middle East and they want to control more land. I think that it's, in this sense, it's kind of supporting the same thing that we want, no matter what their political beliefs, but it is, it's in the same kind of movement, as in we want independence, we want to, actually not independence, but we want to support the notion that everyone has the right to declare as independent. Of course, the Israel, the Israel state is trying to take uh, use the Kurdish nations within Iraq, Iraq and Iran and obviously Turkey to separate these countries and call, call out for other referendums in the neighboring countries to make them even weaker. Israel is probably on the same line of thinking as 
um, more also other Western powers in that uh, they probably believe that Kurdistan can be a, a buffer zone between uh, certain uh, Arab states or can be a sign of, uh, can be, um, that the Kurdish state can, could bring a little bit of peace to the Middle East? Well, I think it, I mean, I'm not entirely sure, but I could say it's possibly to deflect the criticism that they're getting for um, in, inhabiting somebody else, for taking over somebody else's country and being colonizers. Do you think the Kurdish separation from Iraq will affect the fight against ISIS? I don't think so. It's just to, at this point that we've reached the fight against ISIS, it's not just about one nation, one state. It's, uh, it's a multipolar, multidisciplinary issue that has to be dealt with many, many, with, fr with many, f with many, many sides and from different sides. I don't see that necessarily. I think the fact that they're so present in the fight against ISIS legitimizes their um, call for a state. Um, I think historically states are built with war and by the help they're providing uh, the Western alliance, um, that totally legitimizes their uh, hold on the state and on the territory. Well, again, uh, quite an educated uh, clutch of views of Londoners. I'm rather uh, proud of the level of consciousness on display there. Over to you, sir. My, my name is Payam. I'm from London. Uh, I'm a lawyer myself. Um, a couple of centuries ago, they were part of the Kurdish tribe who wisely decided to move to the southwest of Iran and settle there. So uh, not job, uh, Barzani don't have to make a decision for them today. Um, regarding uh, the gentleman here who said uh, in the US, intellectuals make decision for Middle East, I would prefer the term crazed Yankees for making a decision for the Middle East. And what you see today is a chain reaction to what happened in the invasion of Iraq in 2003, who uh, George Galloway have uh, fiercely opposed right from the start and paid a high price for. And uh, what they done, they uh, had a view of uh, new Middle East. This is a follow up to that. It's not a new thing. This was... Um, already uh, uh, envisaged by some countries uh, in the uh, region. And that is why it was opposed. It was not just to oppose a war. It was to oppose these things happening in the future. Now it's a breakup of Iraq. What, uh, the question here is self-determination, great thing, beautiful. But the question is, what price are you willing to pay for it? Are you willing, you need to do a cost-benefit analysis. Um, obviously, women and children will die if we have another war. We probably have differences of opinion on the number. Let's say one woman, one child will die in this conflict. Would you be happy to have self-determination for that cost to pay? I don't think many people would agree to that. And it will be a bloody war um, if Kurdish try to... Um, have self-determination at any cost, just for Barazani to get more power. And um, if you look at America's policy in the region, they have accidentally uh, dropped weapons to ISIS, accidentally. Two times we know about, probably happened hundreds of times, two times they realized that they messed up. ISIS went to a region like this gentleman uh, already stated, and then uh, Kurdish would go and take it over from them. So it doesn't uh, need a rocket scientist to figure out a land grabbing is going on. And uh, a land grabbing have been happening in Israel where, uh, with uh, American weapons. And uh, in this case, um, it is happening with uh, American weapons who wrongly armed uh, Kurdish forces up to the teeth for free and uh, then you have Saudi petrodollars who they have remained very silent, um, strangely, because they share a border with Iraq. Saudi petrodollars are pouring in. That is why otherwise there's a lot of oil in Kurdistan. Who are they going to sell it to? They have no access to international waters. You can't ship it. You can't send it via air, although the countries around it have blocked their airspace to it because it is... Uh, 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 an illegal uh, election it was. They should have sought the uh, Iraq's uh, government permission first. This is the legislation, not 
every people, I'm from Lur tribe, we can't just, and there's a couple of million of us. In Iran, you have Lur, you have Kurdish, you have Arab, you have Baluch, you have Turkish, you have people up in the north with Russian roots. They're not asking for self-determination because they know the price will be heavy and they have to pay by their children's blood, by their woman's blood for it. It's not worth it. As long as the children are going to bed with the belly full of food and uh, you can live a good life, that is the main priorities. Self-determination, Kurdistan have a lot of uh, freedoms in your country that you currently exercise. Maybe not 100% as you want, but this world, we need to be realist, this world is never perfect. Wherever you live, wherever you are, it's never perfect. So this is my view. Well, it's a very powerful uh, contribution and I'm grateful uh, for it. Uh, and it, it moves us in a way on to, to an ideological plane because we're all in favor of self-determination. But what about the self-determination of the others whom your self-determination affects? Now, in some trouble-free parts of the world, you can say that the right of self-determination is absolute. Let's use Scotland as an example. Now, I am against Scottish separatism, but I don't pretend that it represents an existential threat to anybody else. Therefore, I supported the Scottish people's right to have a referendum, a legal one, uh, which could have led to the breakup of Britain and an independent Scottish state coming to pass. I supported that. Uh, although, of course, I campaigned for a no vote against Scottish independence because that's my belief. But if you say that Kurdistan in Iraq is going to declare itself independent, you are automatically impacting on all the other countries in the region. You are automatically impacting on all the national, ethnic minorities within the territory that is being declared uh, independent. And you are in a war zone going to become a cat's paw uh, for all the people that are involved in the war. And that's why I think, to answer your point, madam, you said, well, when would be the right time? That's a legitimate point. But equally, it's legitimate to say this is not the time. Because if you do it now, you, nothing good can come of it. All the borders will be sealed. There may have to be a war to stop you uh, from doing it, to stop Israel making it a military base, for example, which could happen. Barzani could welcome Netanyahu on a state visit and they could decide that the Israeli army is going to be stationed uh, in Kurdistan. That's a theoretical possibility, but actually quite a real one because the Israelis are already in Kurdistan in quite considerable uh, number. This can never be allowed to stand. Iran could never allow that to stand. Iraq could never allow it to stand. So we have a set of competing claims here, competing interests and competing rights. Gentleman in the middle, you, sir. Uh, my name is Albert Lusa. I'm a human rights lawyer. I know very little or nothing of the Kur Kurdish conflict. But uh, from a human rights point of view, uh, the situation seems quite clear. Uh, the peoples have uh, a right, all peoples have a right to self-determination under the UN Charter, the World's Constitution, and under Article 1 of the, Cov of the, the Covenants on Civil and Political Rights and Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. I assume Iraq signed up to those treaties. I'm not sure. But if Iraq signed up... Probably to not. I'd be surprised, but maybe they haven't. But if Iraq has signed up to the covenant, they have obligations under international law to facilitate the exercise of self-determination. And this gentleman raised a very interesting point. Uh, what price is Kurdistan willing to pay to exercise that right? That right has been exercised, um, better or worse, but they did organize a referendum. It may or may not have been lawful within Iraqi law, but it was a referendum organized by apparently the Kurdish people and the current authorities there. So they did self-determinate. Um, the other issue is whether this is enforceable and 
the issue of recognition that you brought up. But um, in terms of the price that they're willing to pay, it seems that everybody expects there has to be an armed conflict as a result. Well, should there be? Why does Iraq or the other neighboring countries uh, feel the need to prevent it by force? Because it's their territory, maybe? Maybe, yes, but... <laughs> Under their constitution? Uh, yes, You but see, the, uh, uh, if you don't mind my saying so, uh, your contribution was <clears throat> pristine in academic terms, but completely unworldly in real terms. Mm -hmm. People doesn't... You doesn't... know, as Bill Shankly, the legendary football manager of Liverpool, put it, when someone said to him, on paper, you should beat them. He said, the problem is football isn't played on paper. It's played on grass. And the reality is that no international law can force a nation state to break itself up. And any international law that pretends it can is an ass. The law is an ass in that case. And this crystallizes, actually. You get me angry now. This crystallizes the globalization idea uh, that was theorized by Blair in his Chicago speech, that you have a right to tell Iraq that it needs to break up because of international law, and moreover, in Blair's case, we'll invade you to make sure that you do if, uh, if you uh, defy us. We live in a world where in, in the real world, Nation states have the right to defend their territorial integrity, and they will. Well, you shake your head. You may, you may say, I think you're shaking your head because, because they don't have the right. Okay. They, they may not have the right, but they will. And that's more important. That's more important. Dr. Sami. Yeah. Um, I think one point has been forgotten, which is that really um, Iraqi Kurdistan is a state within a state. The borders, all entry borders, are controlled by the KRG. The airports are con all unconstitutional, by the way. According to the Iraqi constitution, uh, the Iraqi central government. By the way, the Iraqi constitution was designed and devised by Barzani and some politicians in Baghdad. And it was voted on overwhelmingly by the Kurdish people. And it states clearly that Iraq is a unitary state, and there is no such thing as a referendum for, uh, for, uh, for an independent state. But there is an independent state. They have their own army, although there are two armies, I must admit, one led by PUK, one led by Barzani. They have uh, complete control over no Iraqi policeman, let alone soldier, is allowed to enter the Kurdis, Iraqi Kurdistan without the agreement of the Kurdish regional government. No of Iraqi official, no Iraqi citizen is allowed to go in without some sort of approval. It have, they have created a borderline, although this borderline has been expanded after ISIS. To by one third. Uh, by one third. Uh, so uh, a state is there. The Kurdish people at least are living in peace. They have massive economic uh, potential. Their agriculture has been ruined, not by Baghdad, but by Barzani's policies. Uh, you talk about be people being prosperous in Erbil. Who is prosperous in Erbil? Half my extended family are Kurdish and some are Turkuman, uh, and some are Arabs, like, like myself. But uh, Erbil has severe poverty. So does Suleimania. The Kurdish people in the villages are suffering from poverty. I, I went through a list of people who are corrupt within the uh, Barzani uh, 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 clique. I didn't go through all the names. You know Sirwan, the nephew of Barzani? He owns the biggest uh, cell phone company in, 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 in Kurdistan. His nephew of Again, Baghdad. Though, why should the Kurds be any different from the Arabs? Exactly. The yeah. the no, no, Arab you're, you're right. Well, that's exactly my <laughs> point. <laughs> that, yeah, I, no, no, nobody. I, I started by criticizing the Baghdad regime, okay. I, which I probably oppose more than uh, the local uh, regime. But the, the question is that the Kurdish people uh, have a state, but it's a state ruled by a corrupt uh, clique. Why has he done that? He's a ruler of Kurdistan. His power was threatened by the Kurdish people themselves. Let's hear from the Kurdish lady. I think it's only fair. We'll hear from you after the break.
You're watching Kalimahara with me, George Galloway, for Al Maidin Television, coming from London, discussing Iraqi Kurdistan and the Kurdish question in general. Madam, please have your say. As uh, Mr. Payam already mentioned, when we think at when we are actually talking about right of self determination, it's actually a democratic will. And we, why should we think about killing women and children? It's, we don't do anything. It's not like when you compare it to ISIS, it's, they do suicide bombs and they are, their aim is to, to kill people. But we are exercising our democratic will by calling for independence. And why, would we, why should we think about because killing? Because there's a constitution in Iraq, which <coughs> Kurdistan agreed to, which is that Iraq is a unitary state with autonomy for the Kurdish region. Uh, that's a legal fact, but more importantly, it's a political fact. Kurdistan region is already a state within a state, so Iraq is already broken, so why, why would we... No, it's not broken uh, in terms of its foreign affairs and its defense and its territory. This is the key point. You see, uh, the autonomy in Kurdistan can do anything that it likes, but it cannot open relations with Israel. It cannot invite uh, foreign countries to come and have a base there. It cannot conduct its own international relations. There's a limit to how much autonomy any people in a unitary state can have. And I've just given you some of the examples of yeah. the limit. Yeah, and as a doctoral researcher, we have an extra pressure from two, about 2 million uh, refugees in the region. And we, we should actually, in this situation, think about the human rights and the population, the rights of the population. Okay, thank you. Gentleman down here. Uh, I'm Isam. I'm a senior social worker for the council. There are three countries around. Partly, few of them are in chaos at the moment. And they're trying to get back their territory All through... Are yeah, absolutely. Except everyone. Iran. Iran yes, absolutely. couldn't be properly described as being so, in chaos. But. And Kurdish people, I accept their rights like any other people. Is it wise when countries are trying to become a country by taking away land from ISIS and other people, bringing peace to chaos, creating another situation which can lead to another war? Is it a wise thing to do at this no, it's time? it's a provocation. Absolutely. It's a provocation uh, which is encouraged by Israel, the United States and international legal experts. And then on top of that, um, is it wise that you could actually take the risk of getting rid of all of your autonomy in the end by doing this decision? Well, that wouldn't be easy. Hopefully not. The, Hopefully the, not. The, the Kurdish people uh, are a significant military yes. uh, force, a yes. guerrilla force. Well, Russia and China are against it, and <clears throat> the United States is in favor of it, though Behind in a slightly the, coded way. Yeah. In a coded way, yeah. The United States and Israel explicitly are the only two countries mm -hmm. supporting it. Professor. One question is, do, do the Kurds have a right to organize a referendum? Yes or no? I, I, don't, I no. don't know, right? No. No. Under national law, I mean. No. And the second one is the, the pros and cons of such a referendum. And I've heard a lot of very well-informed arguments from my friends here saying it's not worth it, economically inviable. There are two different things. I can only speak from, in relation to the first one. And as I said, under international law, they, they do have a right. And um, uh, it would be easier if the parties and if Iraq mm. sat down and uh, what is the international law, just as a matter of interest? What is the international law the international that allows anyone to organize a nationally, locally illegal uh, referendum and then declare independence? What is that international Well, I can't, law? I don't know in the context of Iraq because I don't know what the Iraqi constitution well, says. I'm about the international law. Well, the, under international law, all peoples have the right to self-determination, which doesn't mean independence. Uh, the Kurds are already exercising their right to self-determination by being an autonomous region or province in Iraq. That's part of their right as a people. Uh, the Germans, when they united in 1990 as a people, exercised their right as a people to self-determination. The Catalans, in their autonomous condition at the moment... What about uh, the Bavarian so demand for independence from... You would need to Germany. ask the question... Are you telling me there's an international no, law that no, supports there's that? A, there's a question prior to that, is whether Bavarian is a people. 
I don't know. But the Kurds are a people. They do have the right. They have been exercising it. Now they say we, we are not satisfied with the current status. We want Our aspirations are to become a state. That is legal in, under international law in, in general. But in the particular circumstances of Iraq, I, I, I don't know. All of that would be otios, uh, Professor, because but that Iraq never... has a constitution. Exactly. And its constitution states that Iraq is a unitary state. And no one can break it. But was it requested that maybe they should consider amending the constitution, just as you did here in the UK? Yes. Well, let's hear uh, from yeah. Dr. Yeah. Sami. Um, uh, the um, the uh, uh, politicians in Baghdad are saying that had Barzani come and ask for amending the constitution, whereby a right of referendum is given to the Kurdish people, then this would have been... Uh, they, but instead, Barzani did not ask the Iraqi government, did not ask parliament. Uh, a third of the MPs in the Iraqi par parliament are Kurdish. But he knows, had he done that... No, they have not been dismissed at all. Uh, some of them are still uh, in Baghdad. Even yesterday, uh, Sirwa, Sirwa Abdul Wahid, uh, leader of the Goran, Goran uh, uh, Kurdish list. Uh, they have enormous popularity in Slemani and so on. They, they, uh, they proposed a peaceful way. Uh, whereby they could negotiate uh, and ask parliament uh, because there is an article in the constitution which allows changing it. So, in fact, it was part of a deal done between the various political groups when they did the constitution to have an article within it that allows changing it, but it has to be done through parliament. So maybe briefly just make a very... Quick point. Ideally, Take the mic, though, sir, because we uh, want to hear. You. Ideally, then, to diffuse this problem, to diffuse any uh, armed conflict from arising, uh, uh, as a conflict preventing measure, uh, the Iraqi state should then uh, offer to amend the constitution I within a specific time frame, six months, to facilitate a lawful referendum. Yeah, but that, well, then we'd have to have the show. That, then we'd have to have the show again next year because the issue is not do they have the right to have a referendum. The issue is what will happen if the referendum provides a result that says we're going to break away. We're going to break up your country. And this is, you see, I have a right to swing my fist. But my right to swing my fist ends exactly at the point of Dr. Sami's chin. This is an irresistible force and an immovable object. These are uh, things that cannot be squared. If I have a state and I don't want it to be broken up, and you have a right to break it up, you have objectively a conflict of interest. And intelligent politicians would seek a modus vivendi that gave the maximum level of autonomy consistent with the state not actually breaking up. I'm going to give the Kurdish lady, as the only Kurdish person here, the final say. Go ahead, madam. Uh, you have been referring, as many members of the group have been referring to Iraq constitution, and my question is whether any articles of, uh, of Iraqi constitutions have been breached by other nationals, because as we have a clear example of one, Article 140 that is not clearly obeyed by, and why should we now at this point for calling for independence, referring to Iraqi constitution while it's already been breached in many other ways? All, all I can tell you is from the vantage point, if it is a vantage point of more than 40 years, nearly 45 years in politics, concentrating uh, for most of that time on your region, that the last thing your region needs is more states. Actually, your region needs fewer states and more autonomy within those fewer states. Because thanks to Sykes-Picot, thanks to Versailles, you already got plenty of states but none of them work. All of them are utterly dysfunctional. All of them are uh, uh, letting down their uh, citizens. And if I were you, and if I were some of you, I would be arguing for going back to the drawing board and redrawing this whole imperialist imposed Sykes-Picot division of the region. Recognition of the Kurdish people as a nationality within that big picture. 
and the future of autonomous Kurdish regions being able to link up with each other uh, uh, in the pre-existing states. That, I think, is the only actual solution for this. But I'm also old enough to know that that's not going to happen tomorrow. But what is going to happen tomorrow is that some people will swing their fists and some people will say, you better stop just before you reach my chin or you are impinging on my rights whilst exercising your own. Now, I have a lot of sympathy for what Dr. Sami said about the particular character of the Barzani group, though if power were with the Talibani group, I don't suppose it would be very much different. I believe the Kurds have been let down by their political leaders, by Talibani and Barzani. I know that uh, they have been fighting each other for decades and they may very well fight each other uh, again. The Kurdish people deserve better. They deserve better in Iraq. They deserve better in Turkey. They deserve better everywhere that they are. There are a very substantial number of Kurdish people here in England, and you are one of them. And again, I'm going to give you the final say. Go ahead. Uh, I am actually here to look from the eyes of a Kurdish national, and that's why I didn't go into detail about what our leaders are doing. I am a Kurdish national, and as a Kurdish national, I think, I don't know about the timing, but I think we should have a right for referendum and for independence. Just in Iraq? At the moment, because if Why you, just if in you Iraq? If you compare it, I'm originally from Iraq, and my knowledge is more based on Iraq. No, you're a Kurdish national. You I am a Kurdish that. national, Thanks. and uh, yeah. But if we, if you compare the situation with other parts of the country, of other parts of Kurdistan, uh, we are in better position. We have exercised our autonomous status since 1991, and we have had more freedom well, it, but compared. Madam, isn't that the opposite of the point? If you are in the best situation in Iraq, why not concentrate on the places where you have the worst situation? I'm actually going back to the legal side and from the what paper based no, is but saying. If, if, if you look at our situation, Iraq, you paint, yeah, you if, paint a very idealistic if, picture. If you look at our situation, well and if you look at UN Charter and the requirements, we do satisfy the first eligibility requirement, and that's what I think. The, like the UN isn't supporting your referendum. The, the the UN doesn't support your independence. Whatever the doctor, the professor says. The UN doesn't and won't. I'm arguing theoretical, and if you compare it with yes. other parts of Kurdistan... Football's not played on paper, it's played on grass. Yeah. My, my point is, the Kurdish people are being massacred in Turkey. Yet we're having a program about the breakup of Iraq, where by your own account, the Kurdish people have the best situation. By the way, though many people will not like that, what I'm about to say, they always did. They did, since the 1960s, have the best situation. The Kurdish lot was better in Iraq than it was anywhere else. It just seems to me a little ungracious uh, to uh, choose Iraq to be the place that has to be focused on. But we're going to have to keep arguing this, and I'm grateful to you for being so brave, alone in this audience, to speak up for your uh, national point of view. I've been George Galloway. This has been Kali Mahora in this wonderful audience. I hope you enjoyed the show.